So in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, who have given to us the message and teaching and ministry of the apostles, and they still watch over us, particularly we ask the, through the intercession of Saints Timothy and Titus, and we will continue to follow in your ways and be nourished by their example. We ask this through Christ our Lord, amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Um, There are, uh, there is little difference bet between, you know, the word apostle refers to all those who are the apostolic uh, men, the, the original 12 plus uh, St. Paul. Uh, not the original 12, the original 11, uh, you know, 12 minus Judas, uh, then adding in Matthias and, and St. Paul. However, the current bishops of the successors of the apostles. And I know this is nobody else's problem. It's my problem. It's in my head. But when we get some of these apostolic bishops, so Timothy, Titus, um, Barnabas, um, men who clearly had hands laid on them and functioned just like our modern bishops, I, I want to clue them in as apostles. And um, that's what... Technically correct is the, the liturgy at least makes a distinction between bishops as successors of the apostles and, and like I said, those original 13, 14, something like that. Um, whether or not Barnabas was uh, counted as an apostle. I, tell, I guarantee you Timothy and Titus were not counted as apostles. They were counted as bishops because that was at Mass this morning. Enough uh, goofy banter about what goes on, rocks around inside my head. When you look, when you finally get the chance to look at the weekly update, it uh, first three things are opportunities for you to continue to grow your faith through uh, adoration, through uh, marriage, uh, the married couples retreat, the domestic church retreat, and the men and women's acts retreat. Those are separate functions. Um, uh, this week coming up, we will have our junior high students meeting with us Sunday here at the church. And then on Monday evening, we will have our first, second, and third grade students um, here at the church at 5.30 p.m. Um, there was some uh, confusion caused by, quite frankly, me. Uh, if you're a parent whose child is in 11th, uh, 10th or 11th grade as a disciple in, com in our confirmation program, um, I caused some confusion there. I'm going to verify. I'm going to fix it with an email and a, and a text message to you guys later on this week, I promise you. Um, only the 11th graders need to turn in that form. And I gave it to the 10th graders intentionally. I did, that wasn't a mistake. I meant to give it to the 10th graders. I did not realize the confirmation date was on that form. And I know that has caused some confusions. Your 10th graders are not being confirmed this year. As strange as it is, my bad. I, did, I didn't realize the, the date for the confirmation was on the form. That date to my knowledge is accurate for our 11th graders. But I wanted to give the 10th graders that form so they could start working in 10th grade on who they want to be their confirmation saint and who they want to be their um sponsor um because it, it's it is easier to start thinking about this early so that we don't get in the crunch time that we are going to have with the 11th graders because their confirmation is in may and it's the end of january so we got four months to pick this um and if you if you stumble at all in that you know some people like like um my particular process was not very difficult i, I picked a thing i was fascinated in found the patron saint of that thing that person was my confirmation saint it, it took me all of about five minutes. Uh, there's some people that really agonize over it because they have a, a love of certain, uh, they have multiple things they're passionate about. They have multiple relationships with, with great saints and they just struggle to choose. Um, or you just, I have no inspiration at all as to what I should do. Don't worry about that. But we do only have four months, so don't worry about it, but rather quickly. <laughs> you know, if, if, if you stumble, like it, it, you could run out of time. But our 10th graders have, a whole year. So that was a long way to say that I sent the form home with the 10th graders so that they could um, see it and start to think about it, but they do not need to turn it in until next year. I will give you another form next year. Don't worry about it. You don't have to hold on to that sheet of paper. That's just for them to start to think about this. The 11th graders, on the other hand, we need that back um, sooner rather than later um, so that we can double check that all of their other sacraments are uh, in line um, and verify their sponsors. Simple thing, we'll work with you, but uh, we want to get that form back as quickly as possible. I didn't mean to cause any confusion, but um, brilliant idea turned into a bunch of confusion, which as I feel is par for my life. Okay, uh, one new piece of information, um, and by all of that was 
renewed or new, but like I want to draw attention to something that was in, that I have not talked about yet this year, and that is the bishop's appeal, which generally happens at the beginning of the year and funds five major ministries. It funds um, probably the one that you guys benefit the most from is our seminary formation fund, um, uh, and the other ones are uh, youth formation. Uh, Catholic schools, adult faith formation, and then uh, the ministry of our retired priest. Uh, you know, there's one in there um, that I care a lot about. Um, not to say that you need to care about this all that much, but you know, the ministry, the, uh, the the fund to to pay our retired priest is a wonderful thing to give to. Our retired priests are awesome. Most of them have given their whole life to Jesus Christ, and I care about that one a lot. You know, unfairly because that one's going to benefit me in the future. However, the one you guys have probably feel the most is our seminary and formation fund. Um, only because um, you see the guys that are coming out of the seminary now um, and the, the good work that they're doing there. So if you've, if you've appreciated the, uh, the way our priests have been formed, uh, this is a way to give back to make sure that that keeps continuing to happen. Um, you know, there's a major change in, uh, I don't want to say stewardship, I mean funding out there in the world. Um, used to be that you would, you would pay for things by uh, contract or like, so you would pay for things by subscription. So you buy the, buy the newspaper and, uh, you buy a subscription to the newspaper and a newspaper would, would appear on your doorstep every day or once a week or whatever, whatever your subscription was for. And so you had to pay before you received the product. Um, that is not the way most information is distributed anymore. Now the product is given for free. Um, via the internet. And you can, are then given an opportunity, if you appreciate this and would like to see it continue to happen, we have concrete needs. We have to pay our writers. We have to pay for the server that this information is stored on. We have to pay for the website, all those things. If you would like to help us continue to do that, um, here's our PayPal account information. Um, and what it is, is you you end up, instead of asking every reader to contribute, you know, a dollar fifty or whatever subscriptions were, you ask a handful of contributors who really are passionate about this thing to give bigger amounts. Um, so you, you ensure some amount of income for your website or podcast or company or whatever. Um, but it's it's not expecting it from everybody, just the people that are most passionate. I, I think it's important to, th to see things like the bishops appeal that way. This is this is an opportunity. If you want to give back, if you appreciate what you have received and would like to make an investment towards the future, if you know you God is asking you to give, this is an opportunity, and it goes to fuel some pretty awesome and important things. The formation of our priests is by far the most important aspect that keeps out the church in our community going. We get to continue to exist as a diocese because we are able to provide enough priests. Um, and at, at, you know, if you think about it, um, I, I, I used to say that if you if you thought about what it was like to send your one of your children to one of the big private universities in New Orleans, but imagine multiplying that by 12, that's what the bishop is saddled with every year. I have since then learned that some of our private universities in New Orleans the, while the seminary is expensive, whew, man, the prices in some of those big schools are absolutely astronomical. But uh, that doesn't that doesn't remove the the problem that um, for the forming of a priest for uh, a minimum of six years, um, a, a minimum of six seven years now, um, to a maximum of nine years is um, is is not cheap, and we all have to pull our roars, roar, re resources together to get that. I don't know if you know this, but um, a, a guy who goes to the seminary is not going to go bankrupt because he, he feels God is calling him. Um, you could have nothing. And if you get the call and you do the work, um, you, you don't have to worry about the cost of your seminary formation. That's something that you guys have provided. That's something that we as parishes have provided for the men who are interested, even if it just is in learning whether or not God is calling them to the most interesting um, life of the diocesan priest. We are a, um, we are an anomaly to the modern world. Uh, we stand in stark contradiction to many of the values of the modern world. Uh, and we stand for some eternal truths. 
Um, we are at the same time a very vivacious and lively brotherhood, um, but we're a very loving and caring brotherhood as well. Um, it can be exhausting, but it is never boring. <laughs> so um, the formation of seminarians is a big deal and um, is a big, big item. Um, our Catholic Schools Office, our Adult Faith Formation Program, and our Youth Formation Program all provides resources to all of our parishes, so where we can all pool together our resources and um, help our, our uh, volunteers and mentors uh, be the best that they can be. And then finally, as I said, our retired priests are awesome, um, and this helps support them so that uh, um, they can continue to uh, live after they are no longer in active ministry. Lastly, I just wanted to say for Hurricane Ida, I know it still looks like nothing is happening. There's a lot of stuff happening behind the scenes, though. And I am going to be meeting sometime this week or next week, I'm not entirely sure, um, with the architect that is assigned to Christ the Redeemer. So we can begin the process of dreaming out um, what our restoration is going to look like. Uh, some of the things are going to be restored as they were. Some of the things are going to be restored better. I think the, the roof on the family center. Uh, we're not, I, I am going to try as as best I can not to put another shingle roof on that building, but instead we're going to put a metal roof. The metal roof survived the hurricane real well, um, and um, we're, we're thankfully far enough north for now in, in the state of Louisiana um, that our metal roofs are going to survive um, um, even these big, big, big hurricanes as the, the two that we have here, you know. Um, it gets a little dicey the further south you go, but our church building is not going to move that is until the Gulf grows closer and closer and closer. And all of a sudden, you know, Tipito is, is as far from the Gulf as, you know, Lockport is right now. That, that That's another day we'll, we'll worry about when that day comes. Um, so we're, uh, we're ready to start meeting with those guys. They've been brought up to speed on FEMA. Um, remember, because of FEMA, we have to we have to bid. We have to get three bids before we can start working on a project or they will not refund us the money. Um, and I, I'm not saying that we absolutely need uh, the FEMA money, but um, we will wipe out our savings if we do not uh, use the FEMA money, which all ultimately is going to, uh, it's going to come out of you and I's pocket um, because it's going to come out of our contributions and out of all of our other uh, funding efforts. So uh, this is going to keep the cost of restoration to each individual person much, much lower because we're, we're getting FEMA and um, insurance funds. Uh, so please be continue to be patient. I know it feels slow. Um, I, I know this feels like I'm not saying much at all, but um, m my goal is to get a solid modern roof on top of the family center before May. Um, that's that's my, my priority. That's, that's everything else um, for the most part can wait. Um, but we have to start, we have to be able to protect our um, second most important building. Um, I don't want to get into an argument about whether whether or not the Adoration Chapel, the Family Center, or the uh, church is the most important building. You get what I mean. Like, we have three really important buildings on our campus. The rectory is not one of them. Um, and I would like to get a modern building to protect that, that building um, so that we can have it for another 30 or 40 years um, as, as a part of our, our uh, parish life. I know that was a long time to say a few simple things, but sometimes my brain works, walks around in circles. Here's the gospel we're going to read this weekend. Jesus began speaking in the synagogue and saying, Today this scripture passage is fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke highly of him. And they were amazed at this gracious words that had come down from his mouth. They also asked him, Isn't this the son of Joseph? He said to them, Surely you will quote me this proverb. Physician, cure yourself, and say, Do hear in this native in your native place the things we have heard were done in Capernaum. And he said, Amen, I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his own native place. Indeed, I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the sky was closed for three and a half years, and a severe famine spread over the whole over the entire land. And it was to none of these that Elijah was sent, but only a widow in Zarephath in the land of Sidon. Again, there were many lepers in Israel during the time of Elisha the prophet. Yet none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. When the people in the synagogue heard this, they were filled with fury. And they rose, him, or they rose up and drove him out of the town, and led him to the brow of a hill on which their town had been built, to hurl him down headlong. But Jesus passed through the midst of them and went away. 
Let me reread that and add a little bit of detail. Jesus began speaking in the synagogue. Today the scripture passage is filled in your hearing, and all spoke highly of them. Now, of course, those last two lines are the last are, are the a piece of the, the gospel that we read last week. Um, I did find it funny that they, they cut the gospel before this part, um, because they were like, Jesus went to his hometown. They said the gospel is fulfilled. This 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 uh, passage is fulfilled in your hearing. Like he comes to his hometown to just be like, hey, here we go. It only paints you know, half the story. And the scriptures sometimes do this, where they like bury the lead, where you're reading a story and it really leads, seems like it's going to go one way. And then some little details added in in the back half that like, oh, wait, this story is completely different. And, and here's where this is. They were all amazed at the gracious words that came out of his mouth and all spoke highly of him. It sounds like they're impressed. This hometown boy has returned and, and he's teaching in their synagogue. And this is awesome. However, we start to see because of Jesus' response that maybe that's not what happened. Isn't this the son of Joseph? Again, when, when you think it's the same thing. Look at the, the hometown boy. So like, this is the son of Joseph. Man, he came back. And Jesus' response is, surely you will quote me this proverb, physician, cure yourself. And say, do here in this native place the things that were done in Capernaum. The, you know, and, and Jesus is revealing the hearts of those who have come to see him. We have not come to hear from you because we believe that you are the Messiah. We have come because you're because we want to see the stuff you did at Capernaum. And this is revealed in other places in sacred scripture. We want to know where you got all this from. You know, it's at one point they say they thought he was out of his mind because he was saying all of these things. And and then of course, Jesus knows they're on edge. And, and what does he do? This is very typical of Jesus. Instead of going, oh, that's, that's, okay, relax. You know, I'm the Messiah. Chill out. Let me explain to you what I mean. He sort of amps up the volume. And, and he says, amen, I say to you, there is no prophet accepted in his own native place. Now, this is, of course, he is, he is pro proclaiming himself to be a prophet. And he says, you guys are not accepting me because I'm from you. Indeed, I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah. And when the sky was closed for three and a half years, a severe famine broke over the whole land. And it was none of those that Elijah was sent, but only the widow in Zarephath in the land of Sidon. So if you roll back, Jesus is saying, is, is telling the people, you know, that the prophet is not without honor except in his native place. The prophet Elijah lived in Israel. And the Lord sent him not to anybody in Israel, but to a widow in a foreign country. Now, of course, this is referring to the story of Elijah that actually I think we heard not that long back um, where um, there's a great famine and Elijah comes up to this lady and says, could you bake me a little cake? And he says, and she says to him, uh, sir, I, I have a handful of flour in my jar and a little bit of oil in my jug. That's it. I'm going to bake a few straws and my son and I, we're going to go find a place to curl up and die because we're going to starve of hunger. And Elijah's, a miracle there is that the bread doesn't the 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 bread the, it's not that the bread doesn't run out that's the result but that's not what actually happened is that the flour and the oil never ran out so they were able to make these little you know uh, let me tell you i i bet pita bread got real boring over the course of several months then that being the only thing that was provided for because there was no rain um and then, again, he witnesses another thing. Again, there were many lepers in Israel during the time of Elisha the prophet, yet none of them was cleansed, but only named in the Syrian. Now, that refers to the story where there was a, a Jewish girl who had been captured and made the servant, read slave there, of a uh, high-ranking uh, general. General? I don't remember now. Um, high-ranking official in the Syrian government. And the little girl actually in, loves her master, uh, or a uh, Lord, and says, if he would only go to Israel, Naaman was a leper, he was, you know, diseased all over his body. If he would only go to Israel, the prophet there would be able to cleanse him. And there's this whole thraka about um, whether or not this is a ploy to, to create a fight between Israel and Syria. And Elisha the prophet comes out and tells Naaman, go wash in the river Jordan three times, seven times, three times. Wash in the Jordan seven times, you'll be cleansed. And they have to convince Naaman to do it. He's like, why can't I go home and do that? Why can't I do this in this little Podunk River? The Jordan River is not an impressive river. It's very small. You could easily walk across it. You know, we're very spoiled by our majestic scenic bayous and our uh, and, and the great Mississippi River. The Jordan is not a, a huge, huge river. Um, 
and, and it's it's got like a stony bottom so it like uh, unlike our values like crossing the value is a, a total pain um because you're there's no stony bottom uh, there's six and a half inches of very loose soft mud and you're even if the mud is even if the water is only two feet deep you're still swimming across because you can't walk through the mud that's not the way the jordan is and so he, he finally goes out and does it and submits to it and he's healed he's cleansed but none of the other lepers elijah at least didn't do that for any of the other lepers and this is not to say that God doesn't want to do these miracles. It's that it requires faith. And the miracles are faith building. And because the people of Bethlehem do not believe, they, have not, they're no, they are not accepting a testimony of Jesus about himself, his own self-testimony, and they doubt what he is, who he is and what he can do, that he doesn't do any of this stuff. And why were these two prophets sent outside of Israel? Well, there it was because Israel had become faithless. Here, it's because the town of Bethlehem does not have faith in the Messiah, in Jesus. I do I find it's interesting. He uses these two images. I, I, I would love to know if there are more, but I'm sure there's more examples. But he used these two examples. What are the examples about? Miraculous healing water and miraculous unending food. If they, if they had the courage to listen, they might have seen these images. But if you think about it, the, what we have now is so much better. The, the, the uh, connections. Jesus uh, multiplies loaves, and it's not a, a handful of flour and a little bit of oil. It's so much food that 5,000 people couldn't eat it. There was plenty left over from nothing. Yeah. You know, there's so much left over. There's, there's more left over. Uh, 5,000 people ate, and there was more left over than what they had started with. Super abundant. And now, the new bread, like this is the tear. So like there's the, the miracle with the, the flour and the oil that doesn't run out. There's the miracle with the bread that you can eat and eat and eat and eat, and eat off of it. There's more left than when what you started. And then finally, the last miracle with the bread is you take this bread and exchange it for the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. You get the miraculous bread that comes out of the Eucharist, which is meant to nourish us on this world to get us into paradise where we're going to be able to participate in the real final banquet to which the Eucharist now is just a foretaste. You don't know if you've ever thought about this, but there, there's not going to be any Eucharist in heaven. You don't need it anymore. You'll be face to face with the Lord. You don't, you don't, need, uh, you don't need the um, tangible little uh, thing that is a great mystery in this world, but it's only the smallest foretaste of what the real beauty of heaven is going to be. Listen to how powerful that is. The greatest thing we have, the source and summit of the faith in this life, is for this life. And when we get to paradise, we won't need any more because we'll see Jesus face to face. We'll be there with him. We'll see God face to face, be in, in, no longer mediated by anything. Think about the washing. So uh, Naaman has to go jump into the Jordan River and he has to do it seven times to become clean. You get baptized once and the soul is cleansed. Naaman washed his body seven times and on the seventh time his body was cleansed. You get washed one time and your soul is cleansed. This is, this is a linchpin of the entire faith. These are the two, um, not to get into the, the, the business of, of stacking, which sacraments are most important, but the two most foundational sacraments. And the sacraments of initiation. This is how you become Christian. This is how you become Catholic. You get baptized, you get confirmed, and then you receive the Eucharist. And the Eucharist is the weekly memorial of your uh, relationship with Jesus Christ. And these are the two images that he uses. Faith is not about suspending your disbelief, your difficulties, or your doubts. You could be refusing to ask questions because you don't want to, because you don't want to offend the Lord. It is to deny that the Lord has actually given us the capacity to understand that which we are able to understand. I know that's a long way to say, uh, God taught us this stuff, and He taught us to think about it. And he gave us the tools to think about it. Go do that. The place where we get into trouble is 
um, when we stop looking for, when, when we arrive at a conclusion, presume it is true, and ignore all evidence to the contrary. That doesn't work in any other branch of human knowing. Instead, when, when we reach a difficulty, when we reach an impasse in this life, in, in our science, history, math, all that stuff, you reach an impasse, okay. It's just, it becomes another rule that, that you now uh, continue to factor in as you explore the rest of the universe. Theology is just the same. <coughs> Building a relationship with God is, is exactly the same. You don't abandon the search. Just because you found something that, because something you believed, it ends up being untrue. Because let me tell you, this is the biggest secret in Christianity. What you learned when you, what you first heard, remember, was heard, learned, and understood and integrated by the person you were when you learned it. The reason I say this is, be careful. If the last time you thought about the Eucharist, was when you were in religion in second grade. That means you're trusting your second grade you's understanding of the Eucharist. I don't trust myself from like a week ago. Why would you trust some the, the person you were in high school to tell you about the rest of your life in this walk of faith? Look, if it's been five years, 10 years since you've taken a serious shot at, at, at the faith, give it a new try. Maybe you weren't ready. Maybe then was not the time. But there, today's a new day. And nobody trusts themselves. You know, you would not want your nurse to have merely their high school education in biology. Nor would you want your accountant to have merely their grade school ed education in mathematics. You want them to have an adult's view on this thing. And know that even if you were an adult when you first learned these things, it's one thing when you're just just learning a, a new walking in a new world. You don't have any mastery over that. It hasn't sunk in yet. Give it time. Give it time. The faith will grow on you. Let us pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the gift of the faith you've given us. Particularly, Lord, we praise you and we honor you for all that you have asked us to do. Lord, we lift up to you the people of the United States. We continue to grow in unity. The church, particularly us here at Christ the Redeemer, we ask you, Lord, to ease the suffering of all those with the coronavirus in particular, but all those who are sick and ill. Finally, Lord, we ask you to bless us and send more vocations into your vineyard, both to the priesthood and to religious life, and fill the world with healthy new married couples. We ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Okay, y'all. Peace out. I'll see you this weekend. Stay safe. It's going to be cold.